Instagram is the new big tobacco, and Mark Zuckerberg knows it. I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green. This episode of Right Angle brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. Uh, gentlemen, the Wall Street Journal was able to get a uh, hold of some documents from an internal presentation at Facebook, which owns Instagram, and uh, purchased them back in around 2012 for about a billion dollars. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has looked at this internal presentation based on research that was done within the company to determine the effect of Instagram. And if you haven't seen it, Instagram is largely photographs and some videos that is very popular with younger people. Uh, about 40% of their audience is under age 22. Anyway, the data show that there are substantial numbers of girls, especially, and teenagers in general, who are negatively affected uh, by the images on Instagram, and they know it, and they can't stop. Uh, one senator, Senator Richard Blumenthal, likened uh, the effect of Instagram to Big Tobacco, which knew that they had a harmful product. They were pushing it on teens. It was addictive, and um, they were hiding the science. So uh, Stephen Green, perhaps the most damning thing about this report was not so much that social media has a negative effect on teens. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who have acknowledged the potential hazards of social media, especially the unfavorable comparisons that teens might make make with the beautiful bodies and faces of some people that are not like their own, or at least in their own perception or not. No, the damning evidence was that internally, Facebook, including Zuckerberg, knew about this research because they were conducting it themselves. But when Zuckerberg sat before a congressional panel and he was asked about this, he essentially said, well, this is kind of a difficult thing to study. And then when asked about internal studies that they might have done, he said, well, we need to keep those proprietary because we want to encourage dialogue and debate and internal brainstorming within the organization. And so we're not going to release that information to Congress or anybody else. But he would quote studies that basically said, there was no real distinct correlation or causation effect between Instagram and, for example, the 13% of British teens who report suicidal thoughts that they said started on Instagram, or the 6% of American teens who say the same thing, or the third of teenage girls who say that their body shame image, uh, ideas basically came from Instagram. None of this stuff uh, is is determinative, according to Zuckerberg. Steve, what do you think of a corporation that knows that they've got a product that's certainly addictive, they want it to be addictive, possibly harmful, but they're holding the, the research they've done themselves close to the vest? Well, it's their data, it's their platform, they can do what they want with it. Uh, sad to say. Uh, you know, <laughs> you talk about Zuckerberg. Number one, he wants to keep the data private in 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 uh, to protect openness, which Okay, fine, whatever, Mark. Uh, <laughs> Internal the other openness. Is, yeah. Uh, and oh, we, you know, we, we looked into what we're doing and we found nothing wrong, which reminds me of those 50s TV ads where the doctor is recommending one brand of cigarette over all the others because it's so much more beneficial for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. The, the fact is that social media is just a, a toxic brew, especially for first. Uh, for teenagers who are still developing themselves. I, they're two words, th themselves, their selves, I should say. Um, you, you, you've got this toxic brew of exhibitionism combined with fragility on a platform that encourages anonymity. So what that means is kids are encouraged to just flaunt themselves in front of millions of strangers. Um, they are fragile for a couple of reasons. One, because they're teenagers, and that's that's part of growing up. But two, because we've got this, you know, participation trophy culture that doesn't uh, lend itself to it, that doesn't encourage the kind of actual real world risk taking that develops that thick hide you need, and then anonymity, which brings out the worst in people because they can say awful things to one another without any kind of fear of uh, any real world consequences. It's uh, it's awful. Uh, you can't break up something like Facebook. No matter how bad it is, or Instagram, no matter no matter how bad it is, because it's a network. If you want to join the network, you join the network. Uh, that said, there are certain remedies that I wouldn't be opposed to. Uh, how about a ten dollar tax on targeted ads? This is how Facebook, this is how Instagram functions. They hoover up all of your personal data, location data, who you're networking with, 
all of it in order to present high value ads to you on your on your little screen. Fine, let's tax them into oblivion. Why not? They're awful. Do it. Uh, another possible solution would be to make them share that revenue. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they get their revenue by hoovering up your data. Make them pay it back. Make it, Seriously, these free services cost you all of your most personal information. That should be worth something monetary to you. Make them pay back 40% of their profits to their users based on the traffic they generate. That would put a crimp in them. Bill Whittle, um, Facebook is uh, the owner, of course, of Instagram, and they, they bought Instagram because for the first time in Facebook's history at that time, they were seeing their popularity slip among teenagers. Now, it's continued to slip, but they own Instagram, so it really doesn't matter if very few teens are on Facebook. There's a 17-year-old girl in California who said this, every time I feel good about myself, I go over to Instagram, and then it all goes away. Bill, the way the algorithm works, if you watch a little bit of something, for example, an exercise video designed to, you know, shed some fat, then it'll start feeding you more things like that. And eventually it kind of goes down this, this rabbit hole where everything you see is beautiful bodies on beautiful uh, people and they all look great and you look terrible and you're frustrated. And, and next thing you know, you're, you know, you're fondling a razor blade. Um, do you think it might be useful for Instagram to essentially change that spiral into a virtuous spiral. Would you be in favor of Instagram saying, hey, if we see a teenage girl who's starting to slip down that pathway, maybe we should start feeding her more videos that go in the other direction, essentially to steer her in a positive way so she doesn't become depressed and suicidal. Would that be okay with you? So, so Instagram uses algorithms. I mean, I know that. <laughs> you think I don't know that? I know that. Sure. <laughs> All tech industries use algorithms. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows that. Why wouldn't I know that? Of course I know that. Is, is, is it me? Of course I know that. Uh, the, look, um, just because... People are committing suicide. You're trying to make this into some kind of bad thing, like it's our fault. I mean, are you crazy? Is it? Is it me? I know that. What do you say? The evidence is there that that they are providing intentionally videos that that have been proven by their own research to cause teenage suicide and, and, and other things, and they continue to do it. Yes, this is exactly precisely like um, like the, the tobacco companies, precisely like them. And it's precisely like the tobacco companies when, when the CEO says, oh, well, we have our own internal data that says the smoking is not only safe, but actually good for you. Can we see that data? Now we like to keep that internal so that, you know, so we can kind of address the issue freely amongst ourselves. Okay. Um, I, I did a little research into uh, gender dysmorphia. And up until relatively recently, like the last five, six years or so, the numbers of, of people who, 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 who um, claim to have gender dysmorphia were in were three or 400 times smaller than they are today. But most importantly, they were almost all boys. Almost all of them were boys. And almost all of them started to report their first symptoms right around 14 at the beginning of puberty. Historically, gender dysmorphia, which is the condition where you don't feel comfortable in your own body because of your gender, was almost exclusively young males at age 14. Now, there are 300 times more cases of gender dysmorphia. Virtually all of them are females. Virtually all of them are females who are considerably younger than that. And what has changed between now and then? You, you really have to start asking yourself if, if the psychological impetus to decide to not be a girl but to be a boy had something to do with the fact that all the girls you're seeing on a daily basis are these gorgeous, you know, uh, Disney princesses who, um, who live these glamorous lives where everything's wonderful. You, you really start to have to ask some serious questions if these two things are related. Needless to say, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to be able to figure this out. Yes, of course they're related. 
Of course they are. They're not just leading to suicides. They're, pro they're producing so much psychological peer pressure in the minds of, of young women around the world that, that not only are many of them killing themselves, a significant number of them are going to doctors and being injected with hormones or having parts of their body cut off because, without the permission of their parents, I might add, because this is now the way to signal ultimate virtue, right? So yes, this is a poison product. Yes, of course it is. And yes, most importantly, they know it is. And even more, and even more incriminating than that is the fact that they know it, they continue to do it, and they continue to accelerate this algorithm that understands how to send messages to people who are in deep trouble emotionally. You know, I live in this little fantasy world where Mark Zuckerberg sits down before a congressional committee and says, hey, before I take your questions, let me just start off with a statement. I recently saw documents that were presented to me by our internal research team that indicates that significant numbers of teenage girls are suffering significant body image problems depression, and even to the point of trying to harm themselves or committing suicide. Um, they do this as a result of the algorithm that we have set up on Instagram that continues to feed them content that exacerbates this condition. And I just want to announce today that we've decided to cut off the algorithm now until we figure out how to create one that doesn't do this. And uh, so in my little fantasy world, the, the corporate executive figures out that he's causing harm. And rather than trying to cover it up or rather than trying to hide it, literally says, hey, by the way, um, all of your offices will be getting emails with the research documents that we've conducted internally. We'll make it available to psychologists and psychiatrists and Johns Hopkins University and everywhere else so that you can study this too. Because as much as we love the $100 billion a year of cash flow, there's nothing more precious than the children. And we all who work at Facebook and Instagram, many of us have kids. We have brothers and sisters. We want to make sure that nobody is harmed by our product. First, do no harm is not only the Hippocratic Oath, but don't be evil is the Google Oath. And we should all share these kinds of ideas. That's, that's my little fantasy world. Unfortunately, $100 billion is a lot of money. There was one former Facebook researcher, part of their internal research team, um, who said that uh, the work that he was doing wasn't necessarily encouraged internally. And he said, frankly, I'm standing between people and their bonuses. A and that's chilling to me. The idea that people are, who are willing to look the other way and say, look, I know this is causing harm. We've got evidence from our own internal studies, not some outsider who's trying to take us down, but our own internal studies show that we are causing harm for a significant chunk of girls. Maybe right now, Instagram just needs to be you being able to share with your friends and maybe celebrities, for example, who are the driving force behind Instagram. Maybe they step back and you say, you know what? Uh, we don't need to show our best pictures all the time on Instagram so that everybody thinks that we live this charmed life in these beautiful bodies with uh, completely blemish-free complexions. Uh, maybe we need to be a little more honest with people. It's all the people who come from those industries who have the power in this situation and they could exercise that power for good and they could do the very things that they say they care most about or they could be R.J. Reynolds in the 1950s. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.